I think at the end of this incredible journey of Fiji over the past four years, it's of course difficult to summarize uh, it only in a few sentences, but still let me try to give it a try. So I think three of the key take takeaways are all starting with C. So the three C in my opinion stand for collaboration, confirmation, and also rightfully so celebration. I think collaboration is needed for such a Herculean task like banking uh, the world's unbanked. This cannot be performed by any single institution alone. So I think by joining forces, uh, the CPMI, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, the World Bank, the ITU, and also the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have really been able to combine the best of all worlds. All of us have brought our key strengths to the table in financial standard setting, development, technical standardization, and also philanthropy. So I think Fiji is really a proof uh, that the whole can be indeed greater than the sum of its parts. This brings me to the second C, which is about confirmation. One of the key building blocks um, of Fiji um, was the work of the CPMI, the World Bank Task Force on Payment Aspects of Financial Inclusion, or PAFI, as we like to call it. So PAFI is based on seven guiding principles, and we had arranged these guiding principles in a shape or in a form that resembles uh, a house. And three of the foundational enablers at the bottom are public and private sector commitment, legal and regulatory framework, ICT, and financial infrastructures. On top of those uh, basic foundations, we have four catalytic pillars that are access channels, product design, large volume use cases, and financial capability and awareness. All of them drive access and usage of transaction accounts. And by applying these guiding principles over the past years, in Fiji, we really got the confirmation that the Buffy House is indeed an ideal home for future financial inclusion initiatives, uh, starting from a payments perspective. By the way, it's almost five years now to the, to the day. In April uh, 2016, uh, the Buffy guidance was published, and this brings me to my last C. So this alone, of course, is not yet a reason to celebrate, but I think after four years, uh, four or so years, of intensive work uh, in the Fiji context, it's really time to sit back and reflect a bit what we have achieved. And yes, also to celebrate to some extent, because I think we can be proud of all the Fiji achievements. Of course, it's granted that the aspirational goal of universal financial access has not yet been achieved, but I think we are on a good trajectory to that extent. And Fiji was an impressive accelerator on our journey to universal financial access and also frequent usage of transaction accounts. So these are my three the key takeaways for me over the past four years, which is collaboration, confirmation, and celebration. I think in future, and as I mentioned earlier, we still have quite a steep hill to climb when it comes to universal financial access and inclusion. And the pandemic uh, hasn't necessarily make, made things easier. So, we, of course, have all seen and observed that the pandemic has resulted in a shift from cash to digital payments. But there are two main questions, in my opinion, that remain to be answered. A, how sustained will this change in payments behavior be? And secondly, and more importantly, how do we ensure that those without access to digital payments are not left behind? I think there is an important trend uh, and that has already started well before the onset of the pandemic which I would call FinTech for financial inclusion. So the pace of innovation has substantially increased over the past three, five years, leading to what we call as, uh, at, at the CPMI as the era of FinTech. Uh, it has made major inroads uh, into financial services, but also payments, uh, this FinTech development, and uh, it's also playing a key role for financial inclusion. And while FinTech can support improved access to and uh, the usage of safe transaction accounts, uh, it's not a panacea. And therefore, uh, there's a risk that those uh, uh, that, that are not yet digitally included or financially included are left behind. So there are risks that need to be managed. And uh, for that reason, one year ago, uh, CPMI again, together with the World Bank, uh, published a report which shows uh, that FinTech can be used to underpin access and usage of transaction accounts, uh, but yet also uh, kind of highlights those challenges uh, 
and risk that need to be properly managed in order not to undermine a financial inclusion. We call this report payment aspects of financial inclusion in the fintech era, and it sets out key actions helping the relevant stakeholders to strike the right balance between increasing efficiency and ensuring safety on the hand. Combined with our Buffy application tool report, which we published again together with the World Bank in September 2020, I think it provides an excellent basis for those who wants to take the next step in financial inclusion. All of us would have loved to convene in person for the final VG symposium, full stop. I think there's no question about that. Since this is not possible just right now, uh, we chose the format of this online symposium, which aims to maximize uh, the impact. And the symposium is not only concentrated on a few days, it's spread over several weeks and the online format uh, will enable a much broader audience than possibly any in-person meeting uh, would have uh, been able to uh, cater for. So I think uh, all of us uh, have gained over the past uh, year or so extensive experience in online meetings and events. So I'm confident that we will get the maximum out of this virtual pitch symposium. And I think ideally it will have at least the same, if not more impact than previous two events in view of the larger audience, which we can expect in this case. I, for my part, I especially look forward to one of the sessions the CPMI is co-organizing, which is about international remittances and the use of digital services for international remittances. And as many of you know, international remittances are one of the large volume use cases we identified in the Buffy concept uh, in the Buffy house. And it is the real potential to advance financial inclusion. And especially during the pandemic, uh, the money sent back home to the loved ones is a real lifeline for millions and millions of people. And it's more important than ever. So we have seen, of course, over the past years that uh, domestic payment systems have substantially improved, uh, just to mention instant or fast payment systems. But cross-border payments uh, are still largely perceived to be slow, expensive, opaque, and difficult to access. So these are not new issues. Uh, however, I think the improvements in domestic payments and also the development of new proposals, uh, just to think about uh, global stable coins, for example, um, have pushed the cross-border payments issue up to the political agenda. And for those reasons, the G20 at the end of 2020 approved a roadmap to enhance cross-border payments, which also prominently features international remittances. So I think based on uh, this discussion, we'll get additional valuable insights uh, what we can uh, do in order to make a step change uh, when it comes to international remittances. And this is only the overall um, program itself to enhance cross-border payments by the G20, the roadmap as it's referred to um, is uh, a sustained, will require sustained effort over several years. Um, and it will require crucially the partnership between public and private sector stakeholders uh, to work together. So it brings me back to my initial remark on collaboration. And I think if we succeed in uh, collaborating and uh, all of us working towards this common goal, I think we'll be able to bring cross-border payments into the 21st century with all the social and economic benefits that they entail.